doing, sir? How you doing, ma'am? Just want to talk to you for a minute. Can I do that? Hey, I'm talking about purpose driven. Purpose driven. And the subtopic is private victory before public. <laughs> private victories before public. Yeah. A few years ago, I saw, <coughs> pardon me, a documentary about John Coltrane. He was a jazz musician. And, you know, when I start talking about music, I get a little deeper than I should get because, you know, I'm a musician, not professional, I'm a prodigal. Um, I hadn't played my trombone in a long time, but anyway, ended up moving with his mom to Philadelphia, and because his dad, his aunt, and his grandparents, all of them died within a few months, so his mom moved him to Philadelphia, bought him a saxophone, and he began to play in the high school in different bands, and you know, just as normal. He ended up going into the service, and he played while he was there, and after he left the, the uh, armed services, he ended up gigging in different places and he developed an affinity to grow deeper into his craft. He developed a passion to the point where he began to practice literally almost 20 hours a day. He would literally practice one note for an entire day. What, I didn't say a phrase, I didn't say a song. I said one note for an entire day. So he wanted to perfect every single note that came from his saxophone. To the point he even slept with his saxophone right beside him. And his instrument literally became an extension of him. He was able to speak and express himself through this saxophone. And so as he began to keep practicing and rehearsing and perfecting and sharpening his craft, eventually a door opened up to play with Miles Davis. As they interviewed John Coltrane, he said, I never really knew why Miles Davis picked me because I really wasn't the best, but maybe it was my uh, potential and how hungry I was and how passionate I was about playing. And so eventually, they're traveling around doing great, and now John Coltrane develops an addiction to drugs. You know, drugs, very big in the music scene. And to the point he became unreliable, undependable, and Miles Davis ended up firing him from the band. And now in John Coltrane's life, he has to have self-reflection about his life. I'm going somewhere here. I promise I ain't preaching about John Coltrane, but this is going to tie back in in just a second. He had to have self-reflection about his life. There is a quote that says this, when a man can't find a deep sense of meaning, they distract themselves with pleasure. Let me say that again. When a man can't find a deep sense of meaning, they distract themselves with pleasure. That's from Viktor Frankl. He had to face himself and why he did what he did. And, and it wasn't the fact that he was a, a addicted to drugs. He had to find out, somebody say the root cause. And he figured out after a while, I need something that's bigger than me. I need something that's bigger than my talent, bigger than my potential. I found out that I have no purpose. And what happens? He has a event that happens in his life where he comes face to face with God. He gives his life to the Lord and he has this spiritual awakening and this starts the new birth, the rebirth of John Coltrane remember this how he started 
He was passionate with playing and doing all those things. And what happened? He, he would sleep with his instrument and do all of these things. And then he got distracted because even though he had all of that passion, even though he was working on his craft and sharpening his skills, he was devoid of purpose. But once he found out what his purpose was, his life changed. Once he had a rebirth, he came out with another album. I believe it was Blue Train. And then he came out with another one, which was called Love Supreme. And with this one, he broke so many rules in jazz, so many rules as to where you were supposed to be. And as he was playing this song, he literally transitioned and played 12 different keys within the same song, even though his musicians didn't change keys. And to the naked, untrained ear that doesn't love jazz and all of that stuff, it sounds like a bunch of babble. It sounds like a bunch of confusion, but it really wasn't. What he was saying is that I have a new birth and God, hallelujah, is in love with everybody. So he decided to play through all 12 keys because he was preaching the goodness of the Lord. He was preaching repentance. He was preaching the rebirth and the new birth within a jazz tune. And even though people didn't really understand what was going on, they finally started to understand after his death at the age of 40. They even say he was speaking in tongues on his instrument. We talk about kingdom, and I'm talking about this for a reason, because this was not a pastor. This was not an apostle, a prophet, a teacher, evangelist. This was not fivefold. This was a man who came in contact with God for himself, and it literally changed the way he played. It changed his attitude. It changed his life, and he got clean from drugs. He was free from addiction, and he went out as an evangelist through his horn, and he would play, and everybody knew there's something different about John Coltrane, and then he eventually came back around playing with Miles Davis again and got a second chance and then he began to grow and develop even more until he got his own quartet and now he was able to play his own brand, his own style of music which literally started to change the jazz scene all together and even Miles Davis who was ahead of John Coltrane at the time began to change his playing style to what we call fusion. Hope I'm not losing you because I know I'm a music man, but I'm here to tell you that started because of a relationship with God. And what I'm telling you all today is that God might not have called you to the fivefold ministry, but he's called you for a purpose. And when you walk in your purpose, you will shift the atmosphere. You will change the landscape of where you are. People will notice that there's a change on the inside of you, even though they can't explain it and they didn't even and realizing until he died and the Bible says until something dies then other things can live there are things in our lives that need to die there are attitudes that we have that needs to die if we want to make it in the next season I'm not talking about life or death I'm talking about flourishing I'm talking about purpose-driven life. There's always private victories before public. And so 1 Samuel chapter 30, verse 8, David found himself in a really bad, awkward, inconvenient situation. People that came in and, and they were living good and, and he had his mighty men of valor with him. And, and this the, the, the enemy came in and raided the place while they were gone and stole their family, stole all their stuff and took everything. And when David and his mighty men came back, they found the place ravaged and empty to the point where the men literally wanted to stone and kill David, his own mighty men. 
and he fell before the Lord and he was wondering, oh my goodness, what's going on? And he was frustrated and uh, maybe even a little fear. And he, he it's like, how could this happen? We were doing so good. We went handling your business, God. And now when we come back, we find our stuff totally gone. This was not the plan. So here in 1 Samuel chapter 30, verse 8, after David went to the Lord, and it says, then David asked the Lord, should I chase after this band of raiders? Will I catch them? And the Lord told him, yes, go after them. You will surely recover everything that was taken from you. I want you to get what's happening here. David was not going from his emotions. It said that he what? Son of the Lord. Things can happen in our lives that we do not like, that we despise, and we can go by what we feel like doing. But David didn't do that. David acquired of the Lord. And he asked, should they chase them? And will they catch them? And the Lord said, yes, go after them and you will recover all. Private victories before public. David had enough experience to know, I better ask him first. Because when I was a little boy, I went up against Goliath. When I was younger than that, there was a bear. I killed it. There was a lion. I killed it. I have a little track record with God right now. So even though this is a bad situation, it's inconvenient, I don't like it, I have questions, but I know enough to inquire of God first. And where some of us miss it, we think out of our emotions and act out of our emotions first. But the Bible says, seek ye first the kingdom of God and yeah, yeah, yeah. his, not mine, not my revenge, his righteousness, then all these other things. Why must we pursue? We're talking about purpose. God wants us in places and seats of authority. Now, I want us to be careful on how we define authority. That doesn't necessarily mean everybody's a CEO. How many of you know we need managers? Right. How many of you know we need all sorts of positions, but you ought to take the lead in your assignment? And the first one is to govern and be the CEO over our individual selves. If we can't do that, there's no use trying to move on and, 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 and try to run something else, amen? And so that's very important to understand that. And so right here in Proverbs chapter 29, verse 2, you can write this down. It says, when the righteous are in authority, the people rejoice. But when the wicked beareth rule, the people mourn. And it's not just the people that mourn, it's the earth as well. You know, got these earthquakes and all these things going on in the earth. It's because men are disobedient and doing their own things. And so once again, God wants us in place of administration and, and be in place and seats of authority. Because when the righteous are in authority, the people rejoice. Hallelujah. Romans 8, 20. Romans chapter 8, verse 20 says this, For the creation was subjected to futility, not willingly, but because of him who subjected it in hope. Because the creation itself also will be delivered from the bondage of corruption and to the glorious liberty of the children of God. For we know that the whole creation groans and labors with birth pangs together until now. The earth needs you to be in place. 
needs you to be in your seat of authority. Why? Because he told us to have dominion and subdue. I don't want to get ahead of myself, but since I already said it, you know, we always talk about Genesis 1, 26 through 28. It says, then God said, let us make man in our image according to our likeness. Let them have dominion over the fish of the sea, the birds of the air, and over the cattle and the earth, and over every creeping thing that creeps on the earth. So God created man in his image, in the image of God. He created him male and female. He created them. Then God blessed them, and God said to them, be what? Fruitful and multiply fill the earth subdue or govern it and have dominion over the fish of the sea over the birds of the air and over every living thing that moves on the earth i want to revisit this because we talked about the hebrew meaning of subdue earlier which is kavash and that speaks of putting your foot on the neck of something and subduing it by force and with that word, it is literally confirmed in Psalms 110 when it says, The Lord says to my Lord, sit at my right hand until I make your enemies a footstool for you. So both of those verses are collaborating and, and they parallel together. And so with that being said, he talks about us taking by force. Yes for subdue and then have dominion. There are two other uh, uh, definitions here and it relates to not being a dictator, but literally coming down amongst the people and providing for people. It's not just aggressive, but it's also, let me love on you. Let me bring you in. Let me see what your needs are, why you're hurting. And let me use what God has blessed me with to be a blessing to you how can we do that if we don't understand what our purpose is and our assignment and it's very important that we grasp that so that we can enter into this particular uh, place all of us have talent we have abilities but if we are short on what God is actually calling us to do it's going to come to naught. And that's where people start. Once again, that quote was talking, uh, when you're devoid of purpose and understanding, you look to pleasure. And that's how people end up in illicit lifestyles and a lot of other things. Speaking of purpose and, and those type things. And you know, I'm very careful that we're not myopic in our thinking. And we talked earlier about the school of the prophets and what they actually did. And although there was, uh, uh, you know, prophecy that was done and a lot of spiritual things, but they literally learned trade. Yeah. Architecture. Things that people don't think about that. Oh, that, that's not spiritual enough, but that's what he's called us to do. He's called us to be in, in these different aspects, whether it's trade and education and medicine and all of these things. He's called us to do these things in particular, even though we may flow prophetically in these places. But what he does is that he wants us to be sensitive to what he's saying so that we know what path to take. We know what people to talk to. We know what people what not to talk to. We're able to literally break the chains of bondage that are on people's lives, depending on the calling and the position that God places you in. Ecclesiastes chapter 9, verse 10. If you're in the five-fold ministry, is that right? Y'all don't see that in your Bible? No. If you're in the five-fold ministry, you sure? No. Oh, I think I'm reading the wrong thing here. So it says what? Whatever your hands find to do, what does whatever mean? Whatever. That's right. Whatever your hands find to do, do it with all your might. For in the realm of the dead where you are going, there is neither working nor planning nor knowledge nor wisdom. It's important that we are faithful to what is at our hand. It may be something that you really don't care about doing. I've been there. And sometimes we're looking to get a promotion from the same place. And who told you you're going to get promoted in that place? When God, listen, when you work as unto the Lord, 
It's coming to you and it might not be from the place where you at. And that's happened to me most of the time. That a blessing would come out from nowhere, so to speak. I know it wasn't nowhere, but you know what I mean by that. And, and I didn't see it coming, but I would put in to the place where I was. Put in, put in, put in. And sometimes you wonder, like, is this even worth it? But eventually what happens is after you cast your bread upon the water, it returns after many days. Somebody say, work is unto the Lord. Work is unto the Lord. Don't worry about the how. Just follow the principles. Follow the rules. And I promise you, oh, you're not going to want for anything. It may be tough right now. Trouble don't last always. I love that song. Trouble don't last always. Come on, somebody. Weeping may endure for the night, but joy comes in the morning. Come on, somebody. And so if I understand that I can hold on just a little while longer, because it says that Jesus, for the joy that was set before him, endured the cross. Come on. He didn't feel like doing it. Oh, he was such, such agony. He had such agony that he was sweating drops of blood. Have you agonized so much until you were sweating blood? That's agony. Oh, Father, if it be thy will, let this cup pass from me. But ooh, I see Cliff. I see Mama Avery. And because I see them, even though it's thousands of years from now, hallelujah, in a telescope of time for the joy that was set before me because I saw them, I'm going to endure the pain of the cross. I'm going to endure being ostracized. I'm going to be endure being criticized. I'm going to endure this lack, this seemingly lack that's in my life right now. I'm going to endure being in a place that's inconvenient for me right now because I see the light at the end of the tunnel. Come on, somebody. I trust his holy word. And it says, if God be for me, who can be against me? Hallelujah. God is a God of surplus. Even when I'm in the minus right now. But remember, private victories before public. That's God's pattern. And if I keep screwing up in my private life, He's not going to provide a platform for me publicly. Why? I'm going to defame his name. <laughs> I mean, if you have a godly purpose. Because when you're following him, he'll tell you you're not ready yet. There were a lot of things I thought I was ready for earlier. Oh, I was like, oh, yeah, I, I, I know... Let me tell you something. I know I'm going to be good at this. And I just, was, I thought I was ready. And then life happened and I found out I wasn't ready. Why? Because privately, <laughs> I was losing. But when I began to win behind closed doors, when I began to do the right thing when nobody was looking. When I began to develop character and I was able to step out even when others didn't go. Come on, somebody. When I began to be really committed to the purpose, to the plan, to the destiny that God had for me. When I began to become one with his purpose for me. Come on, somebody. Then he said. You're ready. And I was like, no, I'm not. <laughs> I'm trying to clean up this. Oh, you ready now? Because you know you need me now. You don't think you all that anymore. I promise you, 
when you get these private victories, it will prepare you for the next season. You know, last week, and you're going to keep hearing this, God told me in my spirit that 2024 is the year of suddenly. And you know, suddenlies happen very quick. But preparation doesn't happen overnight. That's why God is not a God of quick fixes. Because it'll kill you. I was talking with a brother the other day, and it's funny how people think they want certain things, like want to be famous and all that, but are you ready for the ridicule, especially in the social media era, of people commenting on you and calling you this and that, and you go different places and they see you, and you can't even have family time or dinner, and people are literally crazy, you know that? Like, death threats for nothing? You ready for that? There are so many famous people that are like, man, if I could, I'd trade it all in. Other people are like, you crazy. <laughs> Give it to me. But they're so serious. Like, I, you have to hire security detail. You can't even just go out and just do regular stuff because people are crazy. Are you ready for suddenly? You look at lottery winners, they win the lottery, and, and their lives totally just really is decimated and fall apart. Why? They were not ready for suddenly. They weren't ready for all the frivolous relationships to come up, and everybody's always wanting something from you. And you don't know who wants you for real anymore because everybody's out for what you got. Are you ready for that? Private victories before public. I'm going to end with this. When we're talking about growth, there's a uh, diagram that's out and it talks about the cycle of leadership. And I want to call this the cycle of personal and corporate leadership because I'm speaking to what? I'm speaking of what? Leaders. That's right. That's, a, that's all I speak to as leaders. And so I want you to write these down. Yes. Form, storm, norm, perform, reform. I'll go through these really quick. And uh, the forming stage usually concerns your purpose, your mission, your goal, what you're wanting to do. That's the first thing, the forming stage. It concerns your purpose, mission, vision, goals. That's what it entails. The second stage, which is the storming stage or storm, it involves establishing roles, relationships, responsibilities it involves roles relationships and responsibilities now in the storming stage this is the stage where you experience a lot of conflict <laughs> uh, a lot of going against the grain because see you already got the purpose now you're trying to figure out how does this thing work and so you might have to go through quite a few people at this stage People you might have thought would have been with you, this is where you find out they're not with you because it's the beginning stages. It's ugly. It, it, there's nothing uh, attractive about this stage. And some people don't want you during this stage. They want to benefit from latter stages, but they don't want the beginning stages because it's ugly. It takes too much energy. It requires too much work. And frankly, it's a thankless position. Like in football, you got the offensive line, you're not really noted for blocking for the quarterback and for the running backs. It's a thankless position. But somebody got to do it. <laughs> Amen? And so it's very important to understand the storming stage involves a lot of conflict 
and a lot of change. The next stage here is the norm stage or norming. And this is where you start to um, establish methods and standards and different processes. In other words, this is how we will conduct ourselves. This is the standard, how we're gonna operate. These are the principles that we're gonna live by individually and corporately. And the next one here is performing or the perform stage. This particular stage is where you become good at what you're aiming for. And we talked about John Coltrane earlier, how he would practice literally 20 hours a day on one note sometimes. And he got really good at what he was doing. And when his purpose married his talent, oh, it was revolutionary. And so we have to make sure that our purpose is intersecting with our talents, our gifts, and our abilities, and that is what will allow the landscape to shift and to change. So that's very important. And the last one I have here is the reforming stage. In this particular stage, you don't just rest on your laurels on your last victories. This part of it is kind of recycling like, okay, what worked, what didn't work, what can we improve on? What can I improve on? And once you find out what those things are and, and you're in that discovery phase to find that out, then the cycle starts back over again. You know, there's this saying that says, if it ain't broke, don't fix it. And there's another saying that says, break it before it breaks. <laughs> you know, and so this is kind of like, break it before it breaks. And it's still, if it ain't broken, don't fix it. Because when you kind of go by this cycle here, it's like you understand that I just can't stay where I was. I'm dating myself a little bit, but how many of you remember Blockbuster Video? Yeah. Used to drive over there and on Friday night, Thursday night or whatever, and pick up a movie. I still remember the smell of the place and the popcorn smell and all that, looking through all the uh, VCR uh VHS tapes and all that, and, and then you get it, and when you try it, you might miss a day or two, and they'll give you that fine, that late fine. Man, I tell you, people used to be so mad, like, wait a minute, it was only one, listen, it could be one minute late, and they was charging you a late fee for turning it in late. And so they started making money off the late fees. And people get disgruntled and mad and they just go ahead and pay it because you could go to another Blockbuster. It ain't matter. You still on that record, you know, so you just couldn't do that. So Blockbuster got a little cocky because they was making a lot of money from their late fees. Then all of a sudden this startup comes to Netflix and they're like, hey, we got a brand new idea. Why don't we just mail them and take the late fees out and this and that? Nah, we good. We, we don't need you. And so Blockbuster kept doing the same thing and they refused to change. So all of a sudden, this thing came out called Redbox. Now, they mail it to you, but guess what? There was no what? Late fees. And then it morphed into Netflix. Now everybody's streaming. Where's Blockbuster today? They refused to do the last thing here, reform. What isn't working? They could have easily said, you know what? These customers are getting upset. I know we getting paid off of these late fees because we have to pay the utility bills, the light bills and all this, but maybe we need to kind of think ahead of time. And when they came to us about the idea, maybe we should have thought a little more about it. And today they are out of business because they refuse to change. So with this leadership, and I'm speaking to leaders, it's one thing to get hype 
and say, yeah, I'm a leader and this is on the inside of me. And this, but how do I operate in this? And this is by no means a whole thing of, you know, all you got to do is these five things and that's it because we don't have enough time for all that. But these are five important aspects to leadership. And this allows you to challenge yourself and to, you know, the forming stage where you develop your purpose. And this is the stuff you have to ask God about. God, why am I here? What do you want me to do in this season of my life? Because when you have a purpose, it will help you to endure hard times. It'll help you endure difficult times. It'll help you endure the times of lack. And you're like, what am I doing? Man, forget this. I'm like, I quit. Purpose stops you from doing that. Because it's before you. And when you stay within this cycle, so to speak, you use this as a guide for your life. Now, number one, we're led of what? The Holy Spirit. And a voice of a stranger we will not follow. But this is a good uh, uh, little graphic here just to kind of help with our lives individually and our companies. I dare say companies because there's companies coming up out of here. Come on, somebody. Yeah. I said there's companies Amen. coming up out of here. Yeah. It don't matter how it looks right now. No. Ask God, Amen. what do you want me to do? Because once again, I started with David. Why? Because he inquired of the he didn't say, oh, it's a good idea. I'm, I can't believe they stole this stuff. I'm going to go get it. I'm going to go get my stuff now. <laughs> no, he said, Lord, what should I do? Right. And when God gave the green light, mm -hmm. all, power all power and authority has been given to me, says Jesus, above the earth, on the earth, and mm -hmm. under the earth. And then he commissioned and said, now you go. <laughs> and accomplish the assignment that I've called you to. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And when God commissions you, he pays for it. When God commissions you, he protects you. When God commissions you, he provides. When God commissions you, he sets it up. When God commissions you, There's no failure or a shadow of turning. Because he lives, yeah. I can face tomorrow. Yeah, yeah, yeah. All, fear is gone. All fear is gone. For I know who holds the future. Life is worth the living just because.